we started what we call the area base and divided Cape Town into four to make sure that we bring about a parity of services in all the areas within the city of Cape Town. And so some of the examples of the services that we now provide in each of the four areas in the city is like programs for young people, programs for senior citizens, home-based care for pensioners, uh, health, economic development, housing, we assist with that too, um, and, and also uh, and, uh, help with, with safety and security. So the second lesson that I've learned is that the wheels of the bureaucracy moves very, very slowly. And I set out to inject urgency into making sure that we deliver services quicker to the people of the city of Cape Town. And I can recall, I've always been advised, Mayor, no, you can't do this because the law say that you cannot do it that way. And then I simply use to employ a strategy whereby I will say to anybody advising me that you can't do something, I will say, okay, now go away and then you bring me the piece of legislation, the Act of Parliament, together with the regulations, because you have to read the Act together with the regulations, and show me the clause where it's actually saying that no, you can't do the specific task for the people of the city of Cape Town. And I can tell you 99% of the cases people came back and said, no, 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 it's nowhere in the law, it's just a convention, and we used to do it like that. So for the first six months, I said to say to them, I was a member of parliament, we wrote the laws at parliament, we made the laws, and certainly the law is there to facilitate service delivery, and not to block service delivery. And with those two key lessons from the beginning, I was able then to transform the city into making sure that we drive some urgency in, into the bureaucracy. And I want to share just some of the highlights with you, and there, and there are many, but I've just selected a few. The handing over of title deeds. As you know, for hundreds of years, even more, People of colour, very few people of colour, had title deed to their properties. And especially government-owned properties, rental stock and so on. And so we set out to deliver title deeds. Since 2011 up till now, we've delivered uh, or issued more than 16,000 uh, title deeds to people who never had title uh, to their properties. And that was in terms of the value of redressing um, the imbalances of the past. We also um, looked at all the outstanding land claims and land restitution where the land was in the possession of the city now. Because what happened during the years of apartheid, people were forcibly removed, dumped on the Cape Flats, and then the, the land was simply just given to the city, and the city never in most instances even uh, developed the land further. So I started the program of returning the land to its rightful owners together with the Regional Lands Claim Commission. And just a few areas where we've done it, Rondebosch East, Claremont, Bishop's Court, Lotus River, Constantia, Somerset West and Milneton, just to name but a few. And that we have successfully concluded now, I think there's only one more in the system where we need to return the land to its rightful owners. Other redress projects that I started in, um, in 20, 2011 was to look at how can we as governments show visible change in the townships, in the areas where the majority of the people of the city of Cape Town live. And the first thing we did was that 
Those, those townships were built and the roads were merely just cement slabs put down there, no pavements. And we started through redress programs, lifting up all of those cement uh, slabs, build proper roads, put in pavements. And the great success of that project was is that we employed the local people living in that area to do it themselves. And we also, there were hardly any sport facilities. And the, what we then did was to bring in synthetic, synthetic uh, pitches. Uh, there were also no facilities uh, for, for, for swimming, but it was expensive to build swimming pools. So we built a whole lot of spray parks where people could at least have access for, to water for re recreation. So, in terms of delivering basic services, the latest updated report from the Fa Finance and Fiscal Commission that they came to brief the city on last, uh, last month is that Cape Town is still the best run city in the country. And this is set by the Finance and Fiscal Commission. And in Cape Town, 93.8% of the people living in Cape Town they have access to a flush toilet. 87.8% of households have their refuse removed at least once a week in the city. Access to safe drinking water. 93.7% of people have got access to safe drinking water. The only metro, metro that's better than us by about 1% is Johannesburg. They've got excess of about 94% to clean drinking water. And then, of course, the services to backyarders. All of us always think about informal settlements. Yes, there are many informal settlements around the city of Cape Town, about 223. And that is because of urbanization and the growth of the city. But there are also living thousands of people that are living in backyarders. And I said that the least that we can do for people living in backyards while they are waiting for their housing opportunity is that we can provide them with basic services. So we're the only city in South Africa providing services to backyarders using our own infrastructure. If it's a city-owned house, a rental stock, we use the electric box, we connect two more connections to that. We use our water connection, we connect water for people living in backyards. And that program has been very, very successful. So, we are the best run city in South Africa, but I will be the first, like I said, we still have got a lot more to do. And we must not rest on our laurels. So, the, the, the recent World Bank study that was just launched about three weeks ago, they found that Cape Town is the best of all metro getting electricity and construction permits to uh, investors. You know, many investors complain about the red tape and, and the, within government, but the World Bank find that the city of Cape Town is number one in terms of getting construction sites with electricity and also with uh, permits. The uh, Price Water Coopers uh, report also recently naming, named the city of Cape Town the top um, opportunity city in Africa. And we also the first city in our country that um, s sold a, a, a true green bond for one billion rand to help us to deal with the drought. And these are just some of the, the accolades that we have received, but we must always accept that the accolades and that we receive on behalf of the city of Cape Town is on behalf of all 27,000 people working in the city. And that's why just Friday night, I normally have an award ceremony where I recognize excellence and we award them with, uh, with prices. Now, the, the, the issue of infrastructure, 
The role of any government is to make sure that we have got good infrastructure so that we can create the conditions conducive for the private sector to create jobs. And that's why every year in the city, over the past seven years, we have invested more than six billion rand per year. And then we split it up and we say 60% for uh, new infrastructure and 40% to maintain and repair infrastructure. And that's why you can see that our roads are in a relatively good condition, not all of them, but we are always maintaining and repairing them. And so I'm, I'm very proud of a project that we started in 2013 um, for women. I looked at the transport department and I said, it's too male dominated. You hardly have any gender balance here. And it's time that we change the transport department. And so we recruited uh, four women teams uh, with the EPWP project and we trained them how to fix potholes and we trained them how to clean a gully and make sure that you remove the rubble from there. And we deployed the four teams all over in the city of Cape Town. So they drive around looking for, for potholes and, and, and they fix them. And we also won an international award for that. The, the other big impact project that we've also started, we employed over 800 women, what we call Women for Change. In our poorer communities, there are not enough social workers. And there will never be enough social workers to attend and to deal with all the social problems that we find in our society. So we trained them and they became the mothers of, of uh, within their communities. They deal, deal with um, drug abuse, um, unemployment, school uh, absenteeism. If they find young kids roaming the street during the day, they will ask him, which school are you going to? Why are you not at school? And actually take their kid to school to make sure. So this Woman for Change is another project whereby you mustn't always just do things for communities. Communities are sometimes, in many instances, quite capable to do it for themselves. And then the last accolade is that we also the only city whereby we provide free rides on the My City bus for unemployed people. So, because sometimes people don't even have the resources to go look for a job, and, and we provide that, that, that service. On housing delivery, which is always a key, um, a key challenge for us in the city, from 2012 to about 2017, we delivered about 44,000 housing opportunities for people that qualify for housing opportunities. Now, 44,000 in five years, and you've got a waiting list of over 300,000. Can you imagine how long people have to wait? And so I called the, 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 the housing department and I said, you know, if you plan the same way, you get after the same result. So let us change the methodology of planning. And I'm happy to report that for this past financial year, the housing department increased their target by over 62%. The first time in 18 years in the metro that we've been able to, to uh, increase our targets. So, Quickly, I'm going to run to just a few of the national and international accolades that we've received. Uh, Cape Town, we, we got the C40 award in 2015 for the best water demand management strategy. We ranked uh, among the world's top tech uh, cities. Um, we've got the best airport in the country and in Africa. We are 2017 the global top 100 sustainable destinations, Cape, Cape Town is there. Um, we voted number one 
by the top 10 cities in the world for travelers, uh, tourists, and we also got the number one place by the New York Times in 2014. So um, now, now, just recently, we received another international award. And this award, we're all very proud of, because it's never been done anywhere else in the world. That the city has been able to reduce our water demand by 55% in two years. And um, without you know, having to restrict our water or intermittent cuts in our waters. And that showed you how the Cactonians responded and all helped us to do it. Also in 2018, uh, we're number one city for business tourism. Uh, we rank amongst the world top cities for foreign direct investment. Um, we are, in fact, we are number 21st in the world and we're working on to bring that down. We were the world design capital for 2014. And you can see the impact of all of what is happening in the city has actually helped us to increase and create more jobs. So the unemployment figure in, the Cape, in Cape Town stands at about 22.6, when the national average is just over 37%. So we have been doing some things right, and we have had challenges, but I can assure you that the 27,000 employees of the city of Cape Town under my leadership, they've always given their best. And then sometimes, you know, we also just have to acknowledge it. Well, let me deal with some of the lowlights. Lots of highlights, let's deal with some of the lowlights. For me, the worst experience of the, I mean, the experience of the drought, the worst drought in 100 years, was a time when really we felt that you couldn't look back and see what people did 100 years ago. Um, you need to look into the future, because now climate change is a reality. And you have to consider the impact of climate change on our weather, and so we did a scenario and we came out with a scenario that the new normal is that we can no longer just rely on rainwater to fill our dams, that we need to augment our water supply. Because Cape Town has been identified as one of those drought-stricken cities. In fact, all coastal cities are facing the same problems. Fortunately, because this, uh, Cape Town is so connected to the rest of the world, we could get advice from Los Angeles, from all over the world, from Sydney in Australia, and they all help us to, to, to manage the drought. Now, the other lowlights, of course, that did impact on my, my work, but what kept me going on a daily basis, I remain focused because I said always, the people of Cape Town must come first. And that is what kept me going on a daily basis. And I want to mention just a few. And, and all of these allegations that have been thrown at me and which I was cleared for now, I have not been found guilty of anything up till now with all of these allegations deliberately put up there to smear my name. I've not been found guilty of anything. Let me tell you, I was charged and I was accused that I've interfered with an advertisement advertising for area-based directors in the city. I was charged for that. And then I get charged by the city and I get charged by the, by the party. No separation between party and state. I was cleared of that allegation completely. The second allegation was that, and then at the same time, while all of this was happening, uh, the Sunday Times published the story of how I interfered with, um, with the advertisement of these area-based directors. I went to the Ombudsman, and the Ombudsman forced the Sunday Times to give me a public apology. And I wanted the public apology to be, to, to be published exactly where they, they, they placed that misleading story. 
Then again also, you've all heard about the Steenhuysen report with a number of allegations in. Now, I've never spent so much time with lawyers like I've done in the past 18 months. But I can tell you it was a good investment. It was worth every cent because your name and your integrity is priceless. And I will not allow anyone to smear my name and to mess up my name. Doesn't matter who you are, I'll fight you to the bitter end. Because I know my rights. I fought in the struggle against apartheid for these rights that we all enjoy today. And if some people who claim to be constitutionalists who claim to believe in the rule of law, but when it comes to their own house, the rule of law does not apply. I mean, it, that to me is a real hypocrisy. So what happened? What did the DA do with the, uh, the Steenhuysen report? First, I went to court, and I asked the court to compel the DA to give me the evidence in that Steenhuysen report on which they base their findings. But basic things like the names of people that laid the charges, the surnames, and the date on which these things happened. I had to go to court to get that evidence. I've got a court date scheduled for the 1st of November where we had to compel the DA to give the evidence related to the Steenhuysen report. Then the DA decided, not me, the DA decided to abandon the Steenhuysen report. And what does that mean? That Steenhuysen report has got no force and effect, means nothing, and therefore they had no more charges against me. And that's why they had to drop the charges, because the party abandoned the Steenhuysen report and thereby the charges also fell away. So I didn't make a deal with the Democratic Alliance at all. I've insisted that I want an open hearing, open to the media and open to the public. I even said to those who are now asking, now did you send the SMS or did you not send it? Let me rather answer it before it comes. I said that We've got systems and due process. The one thing that I can say about Helen Ziller, and having worked with Helen Ziller since 2007, but I also know Helen Ziller since 1984. We met each other for the first time in Mitchell's Plain when, when they were launching the UDF. Helen made sure that at all times in the party, that there were systems in place and that you follow due process. That you don't just accuse somebody, any evidence needs to be tested. So I was ready for this evidence to be tested if they could produce it. So that, that is what happened to the Steenhuysen report. Now, the next thing, some guy from Johannesburg who was sitting on um, allegations that I solicited a five million rand bribe from him, Anthony, Anthony Farrell. Since 2012, he was sitting on these allegations. Came with the allegations. Instead of going to the police, he went with this information to the DA. And the DA went to go lay a charge against me. Now, in terms of the Prevention of Corruption Act, all of us here in the room, anyone in this country, when you come across any piece of evidence of wrongdoing or corruption, it's a criminal offense if you don't go to the police to go and report it. So the DA should have been a bit more circumspect. How can this person sit with this information since 2012 and why does it come with it now? In any case, the National Prosecuting Authority have decided not to prosecute and the charges have been withdrawn. The last one that I want to deal with, and there are many, but I'm just trying to select the big ones. There, were, <laughs> there was a fake report 
where some people in the DA took the Auditor General report, Kimi Makwetu. Now remember the Auditor General is part of a Chapter 9 institution. And as all public representatives, we must respect Chapter 9 institutions. Somebody took that report of the Auditor General, forged his signature, and then put my, my picture over it with a red arrow to say corrupted the law, and then posted that on social media. Now, how low can you go? Senior members, the Deputy Chief Whip of the Democratic Alliance in Council, another member of Parliament, another member of the NCOP. I've now reported them to the Ethics Committee in Parliament, to the Speaker, because they show disrespect for a Chapter 9 institution. But I thought I'll also be reasonable. I also complained to the party, I said to the party, in terms of the social media policy of the party, they violated the party's social media policy. It's about four months ago, nothing happened. I took it upon myself then, I then wrote to all of them, and I said, please apologize publicly, and, 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 and I will then consider your apology. No, they, did, they had to publicly apologize by the 18th of October, they failed to do so because they were instructed by the party not to apologize to me because the party will defend them. So now um, I've instructed my lawyers to, to continue with the defamation case. If I can just find a minute, I need to walk down to Caledon Square to go and lay fraud charges against them because it's fraud to forge the signature of the Auditor General and then post it on, on Facebook. So those are just some of the big things. Now, where are we now? When I decided that I will vacate my office at the end of October, we came to the date at the end of October because the Bowman's report was going to come out in the end of October. But also, I uh, wanted some time to make sure that all the projects in the new budget start in July, that we land them all in, and in the month of October, do a handover to the mayor-elect, Mayor Del Prato. We had a couple of meetings already. Uh, I've showed him some of the things that I'm going to report on. And then came this report. Last week, Friday, now, let me start. Last week, Tuesday, the first Bowman report came out. And the first Bowman report that was done by Bowman's Cape Town, um, and I worked closely with them. I cooperated, I, I put in my affidavits, I interviews with them. The first Bowman's report came out and said, I've been cleared and that in fact it is the in terms of the structures act it's the duty of the city manager to report any wrongdoing of um, of an executive director the onus is on the city manager in the law it's only on me when the city manager himself does something wrong then i must report the city manager that came in and I knew about it in the week already. And then on a Friday came a second report, also from the same company. So the same company, Bowman's, conducting the same investigation on the same charge came with two different conclusions. This one said, oh, she must be disciplined you must lay criminal charges against them. I said, but how come and when, when was this company given a second brief? Because the council gave a brief to, to Bowman's in the terms of reference. It ended up that in August of this year, the brief of Bowman's was extended. And not only extended, Another 822,000 rand was paid to Bowman's by a deviation under special circumstances. 
but this time they appoint Bowman's in Joburg. So there's the Joburg report and there's a Cape Town report. And so the immediate thing that I did was to say to my lawyers, please write to Bowman's and ask them what is the status of both reports. And I've got all of that. Uh, Bowman's came back and they said that I must go and speak to the city manager about what is the difference between the two reports. I then went to the city manager, I called him, he said, look, he can't explain how this company, they must explain their own report. And that is why, where we are now, there were a number of procedural errors with this report that purports to find me guilty. And also part of the procedural errors was that this is a confidential report of council and it was only supposed to come before council on Thursday. But on Tuesday already, this confidential report was in the possession of the party and the party issued a statement then already. Confidential report of the party. In fact, I was charged for the Bowman report by the party even before this report came out this week. I was charged already in July for the Bowman's report and it only came out now. So what I'm saying to all South Africans, because I get this question asked almost every day, is that the 31st of August is on Wednesday. And we all know that, I don't have to tell you that. But where my emphasis is now, right now, is that I have to clear my name again like I've cleared it in all of these other instances. So I'm consulting with my lawyers. So unfortunately, I'm going back to court and my mandate to my lawyers is that I want to go to court before Wednesday to try and review and to set aside this report. So that is where I am. I'm taking one day at a time because a day in politics is a long time. So if any one of you ask me, are you going to resign on the 31st or are you not going to resign? I'm going to tell you to wait for the 31st because it's not the 31st. Because my emphasis now is on clearing my name. And I think I need to be respected for that because the law, if we believe in the rule of law and if we believe in the constitution of this country, and many people died for this constitution, many people went into exile for this constitution, then we must respect that constitution. And you must respect my rights, that I've got rights in that constitution to turn to the courts where there are excesses like it is now, where people are hell-bent on smearing my name, where people are hell-bent on coming with these allegations, untested allegations, as if I was found guilty. And that is where I want to leave it. I will also take some questions. But, like they say, in politics, one day can be a long time. Thank you. Okay, we will start with questions. Um, do I have some hands? Christmas for me? Yes. Uh, do, we, we do two or? Two, yeah. Yeah, we do two at a time. Do you want to fill in the table? Yep. Oh, Terry's got the line. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, okay. Oh, yeah. Terry Crawford Brown, first name. <laughs> Since he was mentioned. <laughs> Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes, um, Terry. It's well documented that the very much Government, 
I think we'll take the second question. Yeah. Uh, good I'm Alban Norman from the African Council. I just want to first clarify from? the report that's going to that you want the review application. Is that both permanent reports or just one of them? And then I want to make sure, isn't it a, a bit of a contradiction if you say that the people of Cape Town come first, but the people have also been exposed to this continuous infighting between the DA and yourself? Isn't there a way that your name could have been restored without uh, having this whole fight being uh, uh, conducted in the public and the possibility of affecting service delivery? How? You, you, you say, and tell me how. How was I supposed to do it? How was I supposed to do that? Am I not entitled to use the courts? Am I not entitled to consult my lawyers? Do I not have rights? You will be surprised, my brother. It's just the opposite. Thousands of Cape Tonians on a daily basis are sending messages of support. Thousands of Cape Tonians are praying on a daily basis of all religions. And I'm thankful for that support. And that is what has sustained me because they know that we respect each other's rights and it's my right to defend myself and to clear my name. We're living in a country where the constitution is the highest law in the country, that we are all subject to the rule of law and nobody is above the law. Those are key principles that apply equally to me, you and everybody else um, in, in, in South Africa. I'm taking both reports on review because council adopted both. If council had just adopted the one, I was going to take the one, but because they are contradictory reports, I'm taking both on the review. I'm going to quickly answer uh, Terry's uh, question about, you know, there are all kinds of rumors and all of this, but the one rumor that did go around in the city was that I did not want to make use of the expertise of the Israeli desalination methodologies. And that was so far from the truth. Because Stuart Diamond, and you all know Stuart, a mayoral committee member, I said to Stuart, Stuart, look on the website and see what is there in terms of research that they've done. So that was not true that I said no, the tenders must be given to Israeli companies because I don't interfere with tenders. As politicians, we're not allowed to be involved in tenders. But that rumor or that statement was then reported to the DA. 
And then I was called by the leader, Musi Mamani, and he asked me, in fact, did I stop any Israeli company from getting a tender in the city? And I said, leader, no, not whatsoever. What I did, I did stop companies. What I did stop was that the city's desalination plan was to build about 12 different small desalination plants all over the coastline. And when the World Bank gave us advice, and this way is exact words, he said to me, Mayor, the plan that you have for desalination will never work because it never worked anywhere else in the world. And that the, 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 the people that we were consulting with were just telling us what we want to know. So I then went into the city and I said, look, we can get more water underground from the aquifers in the city, bigger volumes at a far lower price than desalination. With the aquifers, we learned from the drought in Los Angeles that they recharge and replenish the aquifers with treated wastewater so that you don't also destroy your aquifers. So that is why where I directed the city to, to go for cheaper water, because at the end of the day, the cost has to be passed on to the consumers. So I can assure you, um, Eddie, I mean, uh, Terry, that, that I have not been involved in any tender with any Israeli company or anybody else. I have just directed the city to not go for 12 desalination plants that was going to cost us 6 billion rand and was going to produce a, a, hundred, a, a kiloliter of water for 54 rand when normal underground water was going to cost us less than 10 rand. So that's, that's all that I've done. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Thank you so much, Mayor. Just quickly, if you so very all your problems started with um, your analysis um, of the social housing and transformation and spatial planning of the city. Um, would you agree that your problems started there, and would you also agree that um, the DA, well, some of the DA, was against this? Take the next question. Take another one. Any other questions from the... Yes. The Sunday Times must have a word. <laughs> Are you serious? I certainly don't want to compare to Jacob Zuma. I blew the whistle on the arms deal where I warned South Africans on the 9th of September 1999 that this man is alleged to be in corruption um, when he was still the deputy president. So please don't compare me with Zuma. He's also got his rights. He's also, he can choose how he wants to deal with, with his cases. I made a choice how I want to deal with mine. And it's my right that I can exercise the way I want to, my sister. That is, that is my answer on that. In terms of the displacement of people in fire, you're right, we have what we call the fire season. And every year the city of Cape Town prepare for that fire season. 
We're the only city in the country that provides emergency material for people to rebuild. And so we, we stock up with that. We make sure that we have education and we have pamphlets in all the informal settlements. Many of the informal settlements is very dense and that's why uh, when there's a fire, you know, like 5,000 structures could be uh, destroyed like in Masipumalelo. We have started a project three years ago of re-blocking the informal settlements to make space that even if there's a fire, then the, the fire van can come in or the um, uh, ambulance or anything can come in. But it does happen every year. But, and we try and help as far as we can. And fires is not just in Cape Town, it's all over the country. And, and, and as, as how government respond. Our disaster is management and we measure the response of our fire engines, how long does it take for them to arrive on the scene. But we can only mitigate the impact of all of these fires if the communities work together with us. And this is what we are doing right now to try and avoid the fire. Because when people are involved in these fires, they lose everything. Just beginning of last year, as you can know, we also had um, Imazamayetu. The year before that, we had BM section. And so it happened in the city every year, and, it's, and it's, uh, it happened all over, not, not, not just in, in the informal in settlement. But what I will do is that I will send you our, um, our what we call our fire readiness plan for the summer. And then you can see also how, how do we um, respond to that. Uh, Jason, you ask about social housing. The only thing that I was doing is that in the manifesto of the party, it says, in the national manifesto, it says that, this, that the, the, the party and by extension our government will do everything in our power to integrate our cities. After 26 years of democracy, very little integration has happened in all the cities. And the only integration that you've seen are those who are in the higher upper levels who can afford to, to, to buy a house and integrate. And so that is in the party's manifesto that we need to deal with integration, but we also need to deal with the apartheid spatial planning. That's also in the party's manifesto. So what we then did, both in 2011 and in 2016, we took the party manifesto and worked the party manifesto into the integrated development plan of the city for the next five years. So I've done nothing wrong except implementing um, what is in the party policies and documents. Now, yes, um, the, the land that the city made available in Woodstock and in Salt River and in the city, um, close by the city centre, um, those projects have been delayed. In fact, on Friday to my horror, on Thursday, the report was pulled off the council agenda. Because you are right, there are some people who do not want to see the, 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 the party or toe the party line to implement integration in our city. And I, I make no apology for it because I don't need to apologize for it because I was just doing my duty by implementing these policies of, of the party. But some people are resisting it as far as they can to keep Cape Town the way it used to be 350 years ago. Thank you. Um, Lorna, and then... Uh, Madam Mayor, I'm listening to you speak now. Uh, it, doesn't, it really puzzles me because you seem so much to be the ideal candidate to be, to be the Mayor of Cape Town. And it really puzzles me that over the years, I'd like you to explain why in fact this, this kind of war developed between you and the DA. Because the account that you have given is an impressive one over the years in the past. There's a lot 
Okay. Well, let me start with the last one first. In, in, in fact, I, I also don't know what the so-called technical reasons are about, because the one thing that we do in the city of Cape Town will always be compliant with legislation in terms of the municipal asset transfer regulation. I was also shocked because it is delaying the, the, the implementation. You know how long it take to plan. We fortunately, we have got bulk in the area there, uh, but you still have to do all kinds of compliance issues. So really, I think he needs to explain because he, in a public meeting in September, uh, committed the city that that was what we were going to do. Um, the other question about, um, why the war with you and the DA, Lorna? I wish I knew. I can only speculate why. But it's, and it's not with the DA, it's with certain individuals in the DA. That is the problem. And when in 2016, after we came back to govern the city with the 66.6% majority, and I now had to, in consultation with the party, appoint people to different executive positions. Everybody wanted an executive position. So it really started there. And then the next thing where it really took it further is when Alderman J.P. Smith publicly accused me that there was some wrongdoing with the upgrades at my house. And I was bashed in the media for two weeks. And for two weeks, the party didn't come to my rescue until I went to, Musi called both me and JP to a meeting that night because I responded for the first time and said, I'm able to open up my banking account, my house to show people that I have not used city money. So that's where the real thing started when JP Smith accused me of using city-owned money. And this is the report I was referring on to earlier on, where that report was now sent to the Municipal Public Accounts Committee. And the Municipal Public Accounts Committee also cleared me of that allegation. And because the Municipal Public Accounts Committee cleared me, the, again, through the influence of J.P. Smith, they blocked the report from being uh, adopted by council. Now, there are individuals in the DA. I can tell you, people always ask me about my relationship with Helen Ziller. Helen Ziller was the one who came up for me and said that you must 
follow due process, that you are not following due process with the case of Patricia DeLone. And if she goes to court, you're going to lose, and it just happened like that. So it's not the DA, it is certain individuals in the DA that are hell-bent. They are hell-bent on, on getting rid of me. And I just also got tired of this fighting. Because, you know, when you are in an abusive relationship like this, where people throw dirt at you on a daily basis, hoping that something will stick, it's, it's, it's a waste of energy and time. I mean, my brief in life is that I will serve my country in any capacity. That I have worked hard for this freedom of this country. And I don't want to waste my time fighting with these novice politicians. Politicians who are just hardly out of the crash. I, I, can't, I can't waste my time fighting with them. And that's why I've decided to move on. When you're in an abusive relationship, you move on. That's why I moved, Lorna. Thank you. Um, I, I answered both now. Yes? yes that's right. um, uh, Sue Seeger. Um, Okay. You know, uh, Sue, I'm just following also what's happening in the media, what I've just seen since, since Friday, for instance, um, the five councillors that resigned on Thursday, how they were accused that they are also implicated in the Bowman's report. And if anybody had cared to read the report, both reports, that's over 2,000 pages, they would have advised the leader otherwise. And, and then he said in his weekly newsletter that they are also implicated. And now they, he's got until 6 o'clock today um, to, to respond to their lawyers. Now, when, when an organization starts tearing itself apart, when you are internally focused and not externally like looking at the 2019 elections is coming, and you don't have firm leadership that can put out the smaller Yana fires around you or in the party, you find yourself where we are today. It's a very sad day because South Africa needs a good alternative and opposition. But we must learn to look outside instead of focusing inside. But I'm sure maybe when I'm away, um, because the only glue that kept them together was to fight against me. And if I'm not there anymore, they start fighting amongst themselves, which they are doing already. And I'm still there. Thank you. I think anybody in this room, if we talk access to water, we think we go home and open the tap. The definition in the city of Cape Town is access to water is in the vicinity of 200 meters. I think, with my personal view, I think it is misleading. No, you are not right. It is a national definition where everybody gets. Let me tell you now with the drought. There was this them and us. People were saying that the people, them, in informal settlements, they are wasting water and all of that. But there you've got a stand fund where at least five or six families use the same stand fund. They don't have a toilet, they don't have baths and all of those kind of things, so it was absolutely not true that people were wasting water there. But we try and bring water as close to where we can. But remember, some of the informal settlements, people have invaded privately owned land. And when people have invite, invaded, the Municipal Finance Management Act does not allow us to bring infrastructure on a privately owned land unless we get permission from the owner. So the 200 meter that you could possibly make reference to is where people are on a privately owned land. We still want to provide services. So we go to the periphery of that land 
and put the services there because that's where we are allowed to put it in terms of um, in terms of, of, of the law. But if you give me the place where it's happening, I can certainly go look. I can send somebody there. 200 meters is about from there to where. And then I can say to you whether it's a private owned land and why we couldn't put it closer there if you give me the, the area. Thank you. Huh? In the definition is that within 200 meters, that is good access to water. Yeah, okay. Right. Zara, do we have time for another question? Or we, or we, okay. Right, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> So Patricia DeLille addressing the Cape Town Press Club there. Let's give you a wrap up of what she said. She came out in a fighting mood saying she is going back to court. We know she's supposed to leave on Wednesday the 31st as mayor in a, in a deal that they had with the DA. Now she's saying that a day is a very long time in politics. She wants to be respected. She wants to go to court to clear her name and take that report by Bowman's firm on review. Of course, that's what's being used by the DA to say that they're going to investigate um, allegations of wrongdoing. She did speak about persistent rumours that have been um, carrying on, such as the desalination plants and the reasons why she didn't do them, saying that she said no to 12 desalination plants in Cape Town during that drought because it would have cost about 56 rand per kilolitre of water, whereas getting water from underground would have cost just 10 rand a kilolitre. Um, she also took umbrage to a reporter asking her um, about comparisons to her and former President Jacob Zuma, saying that she should not be compared to him, that she in the 1990s pointed out the arms deal and said she believes that there is corruption there, saying she points out corruption. But like herself, President, uh, former President Jacob Zuma has rights and he should be able to go to court and deal with things how he wants to deal with them. She's also saying she's not at war with the Democratic Alliance, but certain individuals in the Democratic Alliance. When asked about why she thinks that there is this animosity and uh, acrimonious relationship between them. She says that when she was appointed, she needed to give people executive positions. And when she didn't give certain people executive positions, that's when problems started. Also speaking about J.P. Smith, bringing up his name, saying that he's the one who said she spent city money upgrading a home, which is not true. She felt that the DA didn't protect her in that situation. They took two weeks to even respond. Helen Ziller, she said, coming to her defense, saying that the DA had has not been following due process and if the bill took them to court uh, they would lose and we've seen them obviously losing in the court battles but obviously that DA saga continues we saw dramatic scenes last week five people resigning in council we are following that story and we'll follow it through SABC and give you some analysis and interviews with party members for now let's take a look at the African National Congress their National Integrity Committee has recommended to the National Executive